Good morning. Good to be here, isn't it? Good to be saved, isn't it? Good to know Jesus Christ, isn't it? Good to have a King James Bible, isn't it? <laughs> we see when Paul says rejoice, see that word R-E, that little prefix at the beginning means to joy in again. You know, your circumstances are always changing in life. We're all getting older. We all lose stuff. We all battle, battle sickness. But, man, there's some constants we have in Jesus Christ that we can always joy in. Yeah. Amen. No matter what's going on in my life, when I wake up, Jesus Christ still died for this sinner. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Jesus Christ still made peace between me and God the Father. Jesus Christ still... Gave me the forgiveness of sins. And there's always something to be thankful about and have joy in. But Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to start off talking about faith this morning. Then we're going to come in and talk about our baptism into Christ. So uh, Romans 1.5. Paul here talking about, you see, when you come to Romans chapter 1, this is the first epistle by Paul. Yeah. Now, you're, you're, you, you see the history of Paul in the book of Acts from chapter 9 going into chapter 28. He was a prisoner. By the time you close out in Acts 28, he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ for us Gentiles. And he talks about this in some of his later epistles. But some of his, a lot of his epistles were written before Acts 28 when he goes to jail. Some of them were written around Acts 18, Acts 16. Some of them were written Acts 20. And so Paul's writing these epistles throughout his life. And, but, but the way God, the way the Spirit of God uh, organized the Word of God, Romans is the first epistle you come to. And this is really the only epistle where you're formally introduced to your apostle. And you're, you're introduced to him in the first five verses. He tells you who he was what he's called to be, what he was separated unto. And so Paul, Paul was a servant of Christ, and the way he served Christ was in being called to be an apostle and separated unto the gospel of God. And he, 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 he defines the gospel of God in verse 3 and 4. It concerns his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And now in verse 5 he says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship. And so right here, Paul's talking about something he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he had received was grace from Christ and apostleship from Christ. And he tells you the purpose for which he received it. It was for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. You know who you are this morning? You are, you are the called of Jesus Christ. Called out from among the nations for the obedience, for obedience to the faith, right? But Paul received that grace and apostleship for that specific purpose. And so that tells me something right off the bat. That Paul's epistles, that what he wrote, and specifically here in Romans as we're going to see, what Paul is ministering to us in these epistles is the faith that we are to be obedient to. In other words, your faith must be compliant to what is written in Paul's epistles. Amen. Amen. If your faith goes outside of the realm of what Paul tells you to believe and what to know, your faith is in rebellion against God this morning. Yeah. Yes, Amen. Look at what he says in Romans 1, 11. He says, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Now, what did Paul receive? He had received grace and apostleship. For what purpose? Obedience to the faith, right? Now he wants to impart this to the Romans. For what purpose? To the end you may be established. Now, guys, here's, here's what I want you to understand. The faith is already established. You can't change it. Amen? Amen? Romans says what it says, and it said what it said before you got here. Amen? 
There's something that's already been established. Your responsibility as a believer is to get your faith in line with what is imparted and been made known and established for us. Amen? Look at, look at, how many faiths are there, guys? One. How many denominations are there? Well, then something's wrong. Hey man, when you got when you you got fifteen Christians and all fifteen of them got a different belief, there's something wrong. Yes, sir. Because these things have been established and in writing and ministered to us for two thousand years now. Paul Paul's ministry was fulfilled prior to seventy A.D. Guys, right? You're coming up on on. What has it been now? About 1,960 years since Paul finished his ministry? It's something to think about, ain't it? And yet you got all these denominations of Christianity. You ask somebody about baptism, you'll get 15 doctrines on baptism. You go ask somebody, how, how, do, how, do, how do I get my sins forgiven? How am I justified with God? You'll get 15 different answers. Amen? But why is that? Because Paul said you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. Amen. And he warned us about this stuff. All right. Now look at what he says in verse 12. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual what? Faith, both of you and me. So Paul had received from Jesus Christ grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. Paul now Paul now desires to see these Romans so that he can impart this to them for the, so that they can be established and they can be brought into the mutual faith that he, of, of both him and them. He wants them to be established in the faith that was given to him to make known. Now come to Romans 16. That's the beginning of Romans. I tell people all the time, man, if you, if you want to if you want to get a good idea of what's, what's in a, an epistle, read the beginning and the, and the end. And that'll give you a pretty good idea of what was in between it. Right? And so Paul has this desire to establish the Romans. Right? Establishment. That's Paul's desire. Would y'all agree with that? Paul's desire is for the Romans to be established. Amen. Right? Look how the book ends. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to what? Yeah. Establish you. Now you see, modern Americans don't understand this stuff. You know, they keep trying to update the Bible. You know the English language has never been as rich as it was in 1611. Right? right. right? Words meant something back then. Is there a difference between something being established and established? Absolutely, right? Now to him that is a power to establish you. And so Paul wants to establish. You know how he did that? He made known the faith that Jesus Christ gave him the grace to make known. How are you going to be, how are you going to be established, right? Paul says to him that is a power to establish you according to what? My gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to what? The revelation of the mystery. You know what that tells me? If you look at a modern Christian today and say, do you know about the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began? And they say, no, they're not established. They can't be. If you believe that book, what I just said, you're, you're, you're like, amen, preacher. That means you got a bunch of unstable Christians today. Somebody said they were lost or going to hell. What we're saying is you've got a lot of believers in Jesus Christ that are unstable because they're not established upon what was established for us. Right. Amen? He says, now to him, he, says, he says the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to who? Remember what Paul said at the beginning of the epistle? By whom we've received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. So who was it made known to? All nations for what purpose? The obedience of 
faith. Right? So this one is the faith. What's been established is the faith. How do you get established upon the faith? Through the obedience of faith. In other words, your faith must be subject to the authority of what's already been established. You don't come along and start a new church every, every time you find a new verse in the Bible. Amen. God ain't talking to you through dreams and visions, little children. God, God sealed. You know what Paul said? I'm going to give you, I mean, think about it now. The apostle Paul said what was given to him was, was for the fulfillment of the word of God. In Colossians chapter 1. It's done. You have everything you need to bring your faith in subjection to the faith that God has made known. But you've got to quit playing the games with God. Well, God told me. And God said this to me. And I had a dream last night. You've got to quit playing games with the world. Was it made known or wasn't it? Made known to all nations. And the reason God made it known was for the obedience of your faith. Meaning, if your faith is not subject to the faith, you this morning are disobeying Almighty God. But I do this and I do that and ain't nobody talking about what you do. We're talking about what's in your head. Are you thinking contrary to God this morning? I tell you what, the only fix for it is that book. Because what that book is doing, man, that's the greatest, that's the greatest psychological, psychiatry, inner man fixing book that the world has ever known. Amen. That book can fix you. Yes, sir. Amen? Obedience of faith, of faith, of faith. Right? And so here's what you end up with. A little diagram here. Right? That's what's established. That's the foundation, right? There's no other foundation that can be laid than that which is laid. You can't lay another foundation. Amen? Amen? But how, how do we get established upon this established foundation? The way we get established upon that foundation is by the obedience of faith. You got to let God tell you what you're allowed to believe and what you're not allowed to believe. That's it. And see, people today, you know what they think faith is? I've, I've observed Christians for going on 20 years now. I've watched them. I've listened to them. Didn't always know they were, didn't know, didn't always know they were half crazy. You know, as a 19, 20-year-old man, somebody stand up in the church, I'm like, well, this guy must know what he's talking about. 20-some years later, I'm like, very few people I've ever met in church knew what they were talking about. I mean it. I believe they're saved, and I believe that I believe most of them I've been to church with are saved men. Right there's the problem. And what I what I've listened when I've listened to people in my finding biblical faith is getting harder and harder to find. It's getting harder and harder to find. Now you find many beliefs. Sure. You find very few of that. You find very much faith. You find very little faith that is actually established and obedient to the faith that God has made known. Amen. You find many beliefs, many believers. Y'all ever heard this one? I just believe God's going to heal me. Oh, yeah. Amen. Well, I believe God helps those that help themselves. Y'all heard that one? Oh, yeah. I believe, I believe we got to live it. Y'all heard them? You know what that is? That's not obedience of faith, guys. People who talk like that are not, they're not subject to anything except what they conjure up in their own imagination and the way they see things. And listen, you, you want to know what true faith sounds like? When the law comes up, you know what true faith, you know what true faith sounds like? When you want to talk, start talking about the law, you know what true faith sounds like? You want to see what it sounds like? Is the law against the promises of God? God forbid. 
For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness would have come by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Amen. You know what that is? That's, that's faith being subject to the faith. How does faith come? By hearing, hearing by the word of God. What most, what most people have today is just a set of beliefs that are not subject to the word of God. And in fact, they, they try to take, they try to use their beliefs and their faith. What, what most people do today is they seek to subject God to their own beliefs. Thinking that God's sitting up there, well, they believe it, I've got to. They, they think God's supposed to obey their faith. And then when he don't, what happens? God ain't subject to you. Amen? So what, what am I talking about? True biblical faith, guys, the obedience of faith is when your faith is subject to what God has made known. That's it. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Right? Paul said in Romans 16, 26, once again, he said it was made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So you know what that means? True faith knows what God says. If it comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and it was made known for the obedience of faith, those whose faith is obedient, obedient faith, a person that's a man of faith, he knows what God says. And I can, I can listen, man, I can, I can have a normal conversation. You've you got to understand that it's not, not every Christian's as stupid as the rest of them. I mean that. You can think it's mean, whatever. I'm, tell, I'm telling you, the great majority of Christianity isn't here. And what I'm here to tell you is a man, a man whose faith is established upon the faith, he knows what God says. And he, he's grown to the point he don't take anybody serious anymore. When they start with that human philosophy and that human rationalism and that logic and I just believe in the way I see it and the way I feel about it. A man that knows what God says knows whether you do or don't. That's why Paul says, tells the Corinthians, he says, do you really need a proof of Christ speaking in me? Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, you know what he says? Examine your own selves. Whether you be in thee, know you not your own selves, prove your own selves. Prove it for yourself. He says the way you're going to prove Christ is in me is the same way you're going to prove he's in you. And if you don't know he's in you, you ain't going to know he's in me. And he said, if he's in you, you're going to know. Listen, Paul ain't, it's no guarantee that he's in Paul, but Paul says this, if he was in you, you would know. It's a simple yes or no. If you're in the faith, you're going to know whether I am. You know, what do you need me to do? Call down fire from heaven? If he's in you, you're going to know. Except you be reprobate. Amen? I mean, if you're running around the world and still don't know which, which preacher's telling the truth, that only means one thing about you. You're a reprobate. Yeah. Yeah. It can be fixed. So how you fix it? Get in the faith. Yes, sir. Amen? Yeah. Isn't that pretty simple? But you know why people are reprobate? It goes back to Romans 128. They do not like to retain God in their knowledge. When you don't like to retain God in your knowledge, you're going to have a reprobate mind. Amen? What is that? A mind void of the knowledge of God. That's what a reprobate mind is. It's a rejected mind. A mind that has rejected knowledge and, and a mind that God has rejected. Amen? Look at Romans chapter 6. I said all that. Y'all understand this. 
And so Romans 6, 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye, ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now the kind of obedience Paul's talking about here is the obedience of faith. Amen? Because if he, he, he doesn't say sin unto death or of righteousness unto life, that's, that's how the law was. Amen? What's going to make you righteous to God is your obedience of faith to what he has said and made known. That's how Abraham walked with God. And it took steps, man. God didn't give Abraham everything in Genesis 12. He gave him a little bit and Abraham walked according to that faith that God gave him. Then a little later on, God gave him some more information. Amen? But we're talking about when Paul says obedience unto righteousness, the way you're going to be brought unto righteousness in your functional Christian life is through your faith being obedient to what God tells you to be obedient to. Right. Believe in what he tells you. You tell Christians they're not under the law today. What do they do? They leave and go start a church based solely on keeping the Sabbath. Paul says, let no man judge you in meat or drink or respect of a holy day, new moons or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. Yeah. But you know what people do? They reject that. And I know, I know, I know the, I know the, I know the motive behind rejecting that type of stuff is a proud, egotistical man wanting to flaunt, want to flaunt his own supposed righteousness in front of the world. Oh, we keep the Sabbath. And everybody that goes to church on Sunday has the mark of the beast. And yeah. yep. now send them my way. Tell them, tell them I called, right? The day, listen, I, I'll be honest with you. Today, I can't handle a seven-day Adventist. Man, y'all need to fire me. Because I'm not qualified for the ministry. Amen? Isn't that what Paul said? Hold fast the faithful word as you have been taught that you may by sound doctrine both to, uh, uh, that you may uh, uh, by sound doctrine convince and exhort the gainsayers. One of my responsibilities as a preacher is to be able to take the doctrine that I've learned and shut the mouths of heretics. Amen. Now, look at Romans 6, 17. So, obedience unto righteousness. But what is he talking about? Well, look at verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from where? The heart that what? Form of doctrine, which was what? Delivered you. So it was delivered, right? There's a form of doctrine that's delivered. How do we obey that? We obey it from the heart. What, what, what Paul's talking about here is, is, is the obedience that brings us unto righteousness is when our faith is, is subjected to the doctrine that God has made known. So there's a form of doctrine that you must obey from your heart. Amen? It's not, it's not just a bunch of do's and don'ts in the letter of the law. There's a form of doctrine that God tells us we must believe. Our faith must be Rooted and grounded in that form of doctrine in order for us to become servants of righteousness unto him. Because if your faith is not subject to the faith of God, you know what you're doing? Every step you take, you're walking contrary to God. It's not until you think the way God tells you to think and stop thinking the way he tells you not to think that you can begin to guide your steps in the direction that God's word. Guys, I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up. Go study the life of Abraham. Paul said it in Romans chapter 4. He says, those who walk in the steps of faith of our father Abraham. Abraham's steps was directed by the word of God his whole life. He didn't have a law. He didn't have any of it. 
God guided his steps because Abraham believed God. Amen. And it only means one thing, man. If our, if our steps are not under the direction and guidance of the word of God, then we are, we are rebellious in our faith. Amen. And so the way this thing, the way this thing works right here is it goes like this. Right here is the word of God. That's how faith comes, right? In the word of God is a form of doctrine. Now, when we talk about the form of doctrine, when you hear and believe that form of doctrine, you know what you are? You're informed. <laughs> right? Christians that don't know what God said, they're uninformed. In, it's, it's when the word of God actually takes formation and structure in your life. That form of doctrine, when it's built up in you, it is building up inside of you a structure of wisdom and knowledge and understanding by which you're going to be able to walk in accordance to the will of God, being able to prove it for yourself. But you have this form of doctrine, the word of God. It's in a book right now. That book is useless to the majority of the world. It just lays there. Collecting dust, getting ridiculed by people who's never read it. Amen? I had a boy tell me one time, he said, that book's the biggest book of lies. He said, that book's a bunch of myths. What a ridiculous book. I said, quote me five verses out of it. Cricket. That's what I heard. Crickets. Wouldn't you think I was a screwball, say something like that to you? Your mom was a liar. Tell me five things she ever said. Wouldn't you think I was a lunatic? Yeah. That's humanity today. Yeah. Sitting and, and calling the, the, the book that the creator of heaven and earth gave them, the biggest book of lies ever compiled, and never read it. That book is ineffectual if all it ever does in your life is sit on a shelf and collect dust. Amen. But what happens? Well, the way that book gets here is through the hearing of faith. Amen. That means there's a let him that hath ears hear what the Spirit saith. All right, there's the Spirit. Not everybody has ears to hear this thing over here. Because not everybody has the hearing of faith. Okay. Amen. Amen. You, pick that, you pick that book up with the wrong heart and see what happens. I'm going to tell you, man, there's a lot of scary stuff in that book. If you read it, you'll find them. You know what God said in Ezekiel chapter 14? He said, son of man, these children have set up idols in their hearts. Shall I be inquired of at all by them? These children of Israel who have set up all their idols in their hearts. He said, do they have the right to ask me anything? Yeah. And then you know how God said he's going to respond to them? He said, when they ask me anything, I will answer them according to the idols of their hearts. And then he says, if a prophet comes and that prophet has been deceived, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet that I may take Israel after their own heart. Right. Remember what he said in Deuteronomy 13? If a, if, a, if a man arise and a dreamer of dreams and his dream comes to pass or the, or the sign comes to pass, he says, and then he tells you to go worship another God, he said, you should not follow that prophet for the Lord your God proveth you whether you love him with all your heart, soul, might, and strength. You know what God's going to send to this world because they receive not the love of the tr truth? Strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned. That's scary. You better get your heart right with that book. Amen. You pick that book up, if your heart's right with that book, 
The way you're receiving that book into your inner man is through the hearing of faith. Amen. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you how to identify somebody that doesn't have the hearing of faith. A better way of saying it. Or the way it should read. You know how that man's receiving that book? He's receiving it as if it's the word of men. You believe that book's the word of God, you ain't going to touch it. You ain't going to mess with it. You're going to receive it exactly the way it's in this form over here. You can't neglect the form and, and receive it through the hearing of faith. If you don't like the form of the book, you've already got strike one. Y'all with me? All right. So what happens through the hearing of faith? You know what you're receiving? You're receiving the word of God inwardly. That's what we call inform. This all has to do with Romans 6.16. 6, this is how you obey, because right here is your mind. That's the first place the word of God goes. Yeah. And what a lot of people do is they're over here looking at their heart and wondering what's wrong with the heart. Right there is the first place the word of God goes, is the mind. It's not going to get the heart to the heart until it's received through the hearing of faith into the mind. And when this happens, when the word of God is in your mind, what you're actually receiving is the mind of Christ. And it's the mind of Christ that's going to begin to communicate with the heart. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your what? Hearts crying, Abba, Father. But you ain't going to have the spirit of Christ into your heart until you first get his mind. Right? Right? So that's what we call informing, right? Well, how does it get to the heart? Paul's got hearing here, the hearing of faith. And right here, you got the eyes of understanding. The way the word of God goes from book form to inform is through the hearing of faith. The way it goes from this inform to the heart it's through the eyes of understanding, right? And so then the word of God goes from being written with paper and ink to being written with, with the spirit of the living God on fleshly tables of the what? Heart, right? And so right, right here now, the word of God has gone from a book to something living in your heart. Amen? And now you know what you do? Right here. You know what this is going to do for you, right? Because now you got your mind, your heart. Well, out here's, out here's your body. Right? That body, that body is under the law of sin. Well, how do I get this body subject to God? Right here. You were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the that which was delivered unto you. The form of doctrines here, it's delivered to us through the hearing of faith. We receive it into our mind and through the eyes of our understanding. We're receiving that instruction and doctrine into the heart and then we obey from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto us. When the word of God gets into the heart, the body will be brought under subjection to God and be made a servant of righteousness. But what does this, what does this have to do with? It has to do with you got to obey and understand what God wants you to obey and understand. Amen. And this is why, this is why guys, like, like I pointed out last week, when you come through Romans, you know, Paul uses the phrase, God forbid, 14 times in his epistles. 14 times. 10 of them's in the book of Romans. Why is there so many in Romans? Because it's your establishment. This is him saying you can't think like this. It always follows a question when he uses that phrase. Right? When he says over there, he says, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. As it is written, let God be true and every man a liar. As it is written, 
Or, or he says, Yea, God be true in every man a liar, as it is written, that thou might be justified in thy sayings and overcomest when thou art judged. Right? Then he says over there, he says, But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? Do we make the law void through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. If you get through Romans and take every time Paul says God forbid, you know what the word of God is doing when it says God forbid? You know what it's doing? It's ridding your mind of corrupt thinking. Because you cannot be established in the faith when your mind is thinking contrary to the way God wants you to think. Amen, 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 amen. Don't you want to be reconciled with God in your mind? Not no longer being, we know the blood of Christ has reconciled us and made peace. But there's this, there's this spirit from the word of God that when it, it gets inside of us, our minds are no longer carnal and at enmity with God. Our minds become spiritual and that spiritual mind is life and peace. Amen. Look at... Uh, Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1. I got a few minutes here. So, what you have to understand is, is y'all understand that Romans is the faith. Everything, listen, and pe people miss this, man. We, everything you need to know about how a man is justified with God is in the first section of the book of Romans. That's it, that's the authority. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God is the just justifier of those who believe in Christ. Amen. That's the end of the discussion, man. Justification don't take care of how you walk. Justification takes care of how you stand before God. Yeah, right. yeah. Amen. Justification is a judicial judgment of the God of heaven that because of the redemption of his son, because of the blood of his son and the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the highest throne of heaven and earth has declared you without guilt and innocent and without charge before his throne. Amen. And he does that freely by his grace for all that believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans 6 ain't dealing with that anymore. Mm -hmm. Romans 6 is dealing with how you continue as a justified believer under the grace of God. And he begins, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Amen. And so now what you're dealing with when you get to Romans chapter 6 is you're now dealing with how the new justified believer who's now no longer under the dominion of the law, no longer under the law, but is now under the grace of God, how does this new justified believer live and continue under grace? And we looked at it last week, two, two things are going to hinder the Christian life, and that's sin and the letter of the law. Both are going to kill you. All right? Look at Romans 6, 3. See that, know ye not? Look at Romans 6, 16. Know ye not? Look at Romans 7, 1. Know ye not? Now this is all in response to God forbids. And what, 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 what I want you to get about this is lacking knowledge here leads to bad thinking. So Paul ain't just saying, God forbid. Right, when he says what then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not. Right, then he comes down there and says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not. So what is he doing? He's identifying 
the ignorance and the lack of information and the lack of knowledge that leads to that type of thinking. In other words, if you knew what I'm telling you, you wouldn't be thinking this way. And so, listen, the faith was made what? Known for the obedience of faith, right? Meaning, those know ye not statements is God making things known to you that you cannot function in ignorance of. If you don't know this, know ye not, know ye not, know ye not. If you don't know these three things, you're going to have corrupt thinking in the mind that's going to hinder the life of Christ from functioning in you. Because your faith is not subjected to what God wants you to know. Guys, I'm telling you, it's the easiest, it's the easiest life. Everybody's like, man, the Christian life is so hard to live. If you're trying to live the life of Christ in that flesh, you're a deceived individual anyway. But when you understand that all I got to do is open up my heart and be faithful to that book, and that book will be faithful to me. God is faithful who calleth you, who also will do it. Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. But see, the problem is a lot of people trying to do stuff instead of opening up and receiving through faith this word that's going to bring them freedom from sin and make them servants of righteousness and living unto God. Right? Right? And so the first thing that Paul asks us here, Romans 6, 3 through 4, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are. Got it? What are you? Buried. I tell you what, I'll wait for your sensual man and your feelings to reveal that one to you. Because there ain't all these people going around listening to the little voice in their head and listening to their feelings and stuff, I guarantee you, not one of them's ever woke up and said, I'm buried with Christ. Because your sensual man can't see that. The natural man has no revelation of that. But we are... We are buried with him by baptism into death. Why? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so the first thing Paul wants us to know, for your faith to be established, one of the things he wants us to know is to know our sanctification by baptism into Jesus Christ. We're not dealing with justification any longer. Amen? We're now dealing with our sanctification by baptism into Jesus Christ. What is sanctification? Sanctification in the Bible is something that's been set apart, either someone or something that's been set apart for a purpose of God. And when something, anything, I don't care what it is, it can be a piece of wood. When you take something and you set it apart and identify it, that's what baptism is. It's identification. And when you take something, a piece of wood, a piece of gold, whatever it may be, money, a person, clothing. There's holy clothing in that Bible. Time. Anything you take and you identify it and set it apart for God's purpose, that thing becomes holy. Amen? It's what holy is. Something set apart for God for a purpose. But the only, listen, how are you going to live out that holiness? How can you live out the holiness you've been set apart for in Christ if you don't even understand why he sets you apart? God doesn't set something apart and then not tell you how to do it. He said, Moses, take Aaron and his sons. You know what God did? He'd already redeemed the firstborn out of Israel, but you know what he did? 
God said, all those firstborn children that you owe me, he said, I want the Levites. He said, and so all you firstborn from the other tribes, you go and pay, you go and pay the Levites money for your, your redemption because I'm going to take Aaron and his sons and the Levites. And you got a whole book in your Bible called Leviticus instructing those priests on how to fulfill the office they were set apart for. Guys, if you've been set apart from God, for God, you don't, ha you don't, have, to, you don't have to fulfill this sanctification to be justified. You're justified freely. What I want you to understand is that you were baptized into Christ to do something, to walk in newness of life. And God, want, Paul wants us to understand this. Okay, now we're under grace. Shall we continue in sin? He's like, do you really not know why you were baptized into Christ? Amen. 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 Buried with him by baptism. Why? So that the same way he raised from, don't you want to know the power that raised Christ from the dead? Amen. Amen. So when we talk about sanctification, Something's been made holy. Look at, look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. See, being set apart for God makes you holy. And that's what Paul's going to talk about here. Through this obedience of faith, we become servants of righteousness. And as servants of righteousness, we bring forth fruit unto holiness. That's where Paul's going in Romans chapter 6. Look at John 17, 17. What did Christ say there? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know what sets you apart? Ain't your hair cut. <laughs> That's it, brother. What sets you apart in this world is you know what God said. Amen? You know the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. That wo thy, thy word is truth. Look at, look, at, look at 2 Thessalonians real quick. 2 Thessalonians 2. I might butcher this one. What does he say there? He says, we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren. Because God from the beginning hath chosen you to salvation. Is that the passage, 2 Thessalonians 2.13? Yep. Chosen you to salvation through what? Sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. What does that mean? Sanctify them through thy what? Truth. What is true? Thy word. Thy word. Now here, here he says sanctification of the... <laughs> Spirit and belief of the truth. Right there's God's spirit, guys. And until you, listen, all the people that think they can find the spirit of God anywhere but that book are a bunch of pagans. Amen. And that's why they show up the churches and flop and pass out. I mean, just, just go to Haiti, man. Right there's the spirit of God. We were chosen to salvation through the spirit and belief of the truth. Amen. What sets you apart in this world unto God is your attitude towards that book. Amen. Amen. Ain't your hair cut, your suit and tie, it ain't any of that stuff. It ain't how much money you put in the offering plate. What sets you apart in this world is that book and how you feel about it and how you obey it. Amen? Now, like so many other doctrines in the Bible, men today attempt to make sanctification a positional doctrine only. Right? We're sanctified in Christ. Right? But any person that studies biblical sanctification knows that sanctification is in two parts, positional and functional. Right? The positional aspect of sanctification, positional sanctification is the act of actually setting something apart for God's purpose. 
You were placed in Christ. You are set apart now for God. Positionally. Amen. Okay. So I was put in Christ to walk in newness of life. What if I continue to serve sin? It's unto death. You know what that means? Because what Paul's going to deal with in the second subject of Romans 6 is functional sanctification. Right now he's dealing with your positional sanctification. You were baptized into his death for the purpose of walking in newness of life. Now do you not know if you serve sin, it's unto death? So how can I fulfill my sanctified purpose in Christ if I continue to serve sin? I can't. So how am I going to be how am I going to go from being a servant of sin to a servant of righteousness? I have to obey from the heart the form of doctrine that's been delivered. And if I get, if I get to Romans 7 and I start disobeying and say, well, I think I'm under the letter of the law. Guess what? I can't fulfill my sanctified purpose in Christ through the letter of the law. I can only do it through newness of spirit. And this is where Paul's going with all this. He's talking about how you walk after you get saved. And so we're talking about positional. There is positional sanctification. Every person that's been baptized into Jesus Christ is sanctified and set apart for God. Yes. But not every Christian is walking Amen. and fulfilling that purpose for which they were set apart for God. And so positional, functional, and, and you know what that is, guys, honest to goodness, you know what that is. It's sad that we... <laughs> It's sad that we still got to explain these things to men, to, to men who's been preachers for 25, 30 years, but we do. Positional and functional sanctification is basic Bible 101. Amen. Amen. Jerusalem. Has Jerusalem been set apart for God? It's called the holy city. That holy city is in a holy land. So there's a piece of land that's been set apart. And within that land is something even holier than the land, and it's a holy city. And in that holy city is a holy mount. It just keeps getting holier and holier the closer you get to the pinpoint of God's location. What makes that place holy is it's been chosen by God. Where his throne and the government of heaven and earth is going to be operated one day. Now, has Jerusalem been set apart? Is Jerusalem fulfilling that purpose today? Right now it's desolate. All right, God, God said build an altar. Build an altar. Make it five cubits by five cubits, right? They put some horns on this thing here on the corners and and there was fire, fire burning under that thing. There was grills on it and everything. Five by five. God was very specific in the building of that thing. Do y'all know five's the number of death? Something was dying on that altar morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening. To appease the fire of that altar. Amen. God's telling you, you can't approach me outside of death. Something's got to appease my wrath before you take any further steps to my presence. Amen? Now that altar, Moses was told to build it. They built it. You know what that altar was? It was set apart for a purpose. You had to burn sacrifices on that. Well, what if you didn't? The altar didn't fulfill its purpose. It's functional. Aaron and his sons. Moses, you take and you make these garments and these breastplates and this ephod and the, 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 the thummim and the urim, all that stuff and the, the holy mitre that says holiness unto the Lord on it. And he told him how to build all these garments. And then, and then he says, now take Aaron and his sons and wash them in water and sprinkle blood upon them. You know what they're being do? Do you know what's going on there? They're being set apart and consecrated for an office. Now what if they went home? God did all that. Gave them the garments, the instructions. Gave them a whole book of Leviticus. And those priests just went home. It's like, I'm going to go about my business. I ain't spending the rest of my life serving 
as a priest of Israel. I've got better things to be doing. They didn't function. You see the difference between positional and functional sanctification. Right? Let me give you a few verses. Look at, look at, look, just come to 1 Thessalonians real quick. Let me read you this one. And see, when you, when you understand positional and functional sanctification, you'll understand why Paul tells us to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Understanding what you've been set apart for, and because you've been set apart, Paul says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And I will receive you. And Paul says, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. But look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, verse 1, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God. Who, all, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. What has God called us to? Holiness. And the way God wants us to know how to possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. Amen? That's functional sanctification. One more place and I'm done. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I promise, last passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because what's Paul doing here? Paul's dealing with our baptism into the death and burial of Christ, right? You've been baptized and identified back here. And the reason you were baptized in his death is so that as he was raised from the dead, you also should walk in newness of life. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 10.1. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you what? Ignorant. ignorant. Now, there's two ways to be ignorant. Either don't know, you're uninformed. That's uninformed ignorance. There's uninformed ignorance. Second way you can be ignorant is know and refuse to acknowledge. What I'm about to tell you, you better get. That all the children of Israel that came out of Egypt were baptized unto Moses. Paul ain't talking about their redemption. He ain't talking about Passover here. He ain't talking about blood. He's saying that every one of those children that God brought out of Egypt and purchased with the blood of that lamb, he took them and baptized them in the Red Sea. You know what happened at the Red Sea? The old taskmaster was coming to bring them back in bondage. And God split that Red Sea and the children of Israel went over and Pharaoh and his armies were killed. That's what happened to you. When you got baptized into Christ, your old man was crucified with him. And when the children of Israel came out on the other side of that Red Sea, Pharaoh was gone and washed up on the sea, and they were now separated unto Moses. Moses was the lawgiver. Four chapters later, God brings them to Mount Sinai and says, Now if you will obey my voice, you will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Why were they baptized unto Moses? So that they could be a holy nation unto God. How did Israel respond to that? Well, read the chapter. With many of them, God was not well pleased. All you positional Christians who think that all, all that matters is that you're in Christ. And you never walk in the newness of life. You never take in the form of doctrine God wants you to have and let Christ be formed in your inner man. All of you positional only Christians, right? Israel was baptized unto Moses, and yet with many of them God wasn't pleased. 
And he, you know what he says? He says, those men were an example to you so that you would quit lusting after evil things. Quit being idolaters. Quit being fornicators. Quit tempting Christ. Quit murmuring. He said, those things happen unto them and they for are, are for our learning and admonition. Look at what he says in verse 12 and I'm, I'm done. Verse 12. Wherefore, in light of this, wherefore, let him that thinketh he what? Take what? Lest he what? There you go. That's positional Christians. They think they stand. Because I'm sanctified in Christ. I'm this in Christ. I'm that in Christ. You better take heed. Lest you fall. Amen. Because you were baptized in the Christ for a purpose. And if you don't understand how this sanctification is going to operate in you so that you can walk in newness of life, if you get messed up in the principles of Romans, death is real there. Serve sin unto death. I was alive without the law. The commandment came. Sin revived and I dead. died. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Well, why is Paul saying, deliver me from this body of death when he was baptized into Christ to walk in newness of life? He obviously ain't walking in it because he's trying to walk according to the letter of the law. Amen. So you were baptized into Christ to be pleasing unto God through newness of life, walking in newness of life. And so, and so this is what Paul's dealing with here in Romans 6. So, Y'all understand your sanctified purpose. Baptize into Christ to walk in newness of life. Amen? That's just positional. That's why you're in Christ. That doesn't tell you how to function in him, but it tells you why you're in him. And that's principle number one. And if you understand why you're in him, you ain't going to be walking around going, well, it don't matter if I sin because I'm under grace. That's the kind of thinking Paul's correcting here. Will you go to heaven if you continue in sin? Absolutely, if you've been justified unto eternal life. Yes, but do you not know why you were baptized into him? Amen. And we, we, God wants us to be pleasing unto him through walking in this newness of life. Any questions before I close? All right. Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for the precious blood of our Savior. We thank you, God, for the forgiveness of sins and the the great calling into your eternal purpose. We thank you for your word. We thank you for those that have come out this morning. Lord, we pray for those that couldn't be here. And God, we just pray that your spirit, uh, uh, as, it, as it proceeds off the pages of this book this morning, Father, we pray that, that everyone here would have ears of, of faith and, and, and we pray that the eyes of their understanding would be open to behold these great wondrous things out of your word. Father, teach us to, to walk day by day in, in a way that's pleasing to you. Instruct us in righteousness uh, that we may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And we just ask it in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.